don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited to be talking about music, and we kick off a brand new series. A series around here is simply a term we use for a collection of messages that maybe take place over a couple of weeks, maybe a conversation that we have that goes over a few weeks, and today we're kicking off a brand new one, and since it's International Country Music Day, I know, right, you all knew that, um, <laughs> we're starting a brand new series, um, because country music is such an amazing genre, every song seems to tell a story, right? And so we thought it was appropriate to be kicking off a brand new series today talking about music and the impact it has on our lives. Now, uh, I have so many songs in my life that have had an impact or perhaps left an imprint on my life. And uh, if you were to ask me, hey, what are some of those songs? If you were to say, hey, collection of songs, maybe if you were to ask me to represent my life as a playlist, um, I would maybe say that some of these songs would appear on my list. And, and don't laugh, but the first one's this one, the Pumpkin Patch theme song, right? <laughs> I have such fond memories of Pumpkin Patch. How many of you are singing the theme tune in your head right now, right? Yeah, uh, Pumpkin Patch was such a great, you know, great, great fond memories of growing up um, watching that program. But also, um, that, was what, that was the first record that my brother tried to DJ on on my parents' turntable, scratched it to shreds, but enjoyed the experience. And, uh, you know, that got him into his DJ career for a little bit before he studied medicine, which was a much better career for him um, <laughs> in the midst of that. But um, another song that would make it onto this, Summer of 69 by Brian Adams. There we go. I got a, got a fan in front here. Summer of 69 was actually the first song I ever performed in front of anybody. Um, I learned to play the bass guitar in high school and played that for my class in, I think, probably grade eight. And uh, Brian Adams also happens to be one of Killian, my favorite artists. Any Brian Adams fans? Yeah, there you go. So, um, <clears throat> spoiler, I managed to get Kelly backstage to meet Brian a couple of years ago, um, but that's a story for another time, and you can go ask her, or maybe I'll, I'll tell it sometime, not, but not today. There's no time for that today. Closing Time by Semisonic. Uh, Closing Time is uh, my, mal- my matric valedictory song. Um, it has some great memories associated with that song for my matric year. Um, it also represents the closing of a chapter in my life, closing high school with great time, great friends, just enjoying what was going on during that period of time. Uh, the next one is The Killers um, uh, by uh, Mr. Brightside by The Killers. Uh, those of you who know that song, it's kind of like my wife and my theme song. Um, yeah, it's got some great memories attached to it for both of us, but also us going dancing with friends in Claremont or in Stellenbosch. It's had a great time, great association with that song as well. A lesser known song by Keen, uh, Is It Any Wonder? Um, I actually had one of those like flip phones. You remember those flip phones that everyone used to have? I had one of those and this was the ringtone. And still to this day, if that song comes on the radio, if I hear that song, I'm like, where's my phone? Because I need it. My phone's ringing. Like I need to answer my phone in there. And the last one is Look What You've Done For Me by Tree 63. And I, I put that one up there because um, I think this song happens to be one of the foundational elements of my faith. Um, I, it's a song of gratitude, singing to God, hey, look what you've done for me. Um, I led worship for many years in a Methodist church, and that was one of my favorite songs to be able to sing when that was part of our set on a Sunday morning. And I I loved singing that song. And one of the reasons it was fundamental in my faith was because it it came in a life where I was just that grateful. I I was just grateful for everything going on. Um, And a friend of ours managed to get us in the front row of a Tree 63 concert um, here in Cape Town while they were playing. And John Ellis, the front man, started playing, look what you've done for me. And as you can imagine at a concert, everyone sings along, right? There's thousands of voices singing along to this song. And somehow there's this amazing thing that happens at concerts. Everyone knows when they're going to stop singing, right? You know that moment when everyone stops singing? Well, apparently everyone else had the memo and I didn't because I carried on singing and everyone else stopped. Uh, I was the only person in the crowd of like 2,000 people who carried on singing. Uh, Anyway, John Ellis heard me from stage um, and wanted to know who it was, and my friends ratted me out. And uh, he leaned into the crowd, gave me a high five, and I didn't wash his hand for a week. Like, it it was lovely. It was amazing. It really was. But... You know, one of the things is I have songs that are associated with my life, but I also have entire albums that I would classify as parts of my life as well. Uh, I studied architecture at UCT, and we were known for doing these things called all-nighters, where we would spend the entire night working on our projects, building models, drawing plans and elevations at at class. I, I didn't pull many of them, but you could often find me sleeping under my desk in a very crowded and very noisy studio, and the only way I did that was by listening to music. And so I have albums by Huberstan, Coldplay, Linkin Park, uh, Reliant K, Tree 63, Brian Adams, that when I hear those songs from those albums, I'm like, man, I'm back at university again. It is amazing. Um, The great Stevie Wonder says this about music. He says that music at its essence is what gives us memories. And the longer a song has existed in our lives, the more memories we have of it. Isn't that so true? Isn't it true that when we experience uh, music, we hear a song, there's a memory attached to it? 
that when you hear a song on the radio, there's this memory of maybe an event, maybe it's a tragedy, maybe it's um, just a great time at school or high school, or maybe in life, you know, like your wedding song. There's these memories that come up with um, these things. And I think what's amazing about music is that music plays throughout our lives. And the longer a song has been around, the more memories we have associated with it. And so that's what we kind of want to do in this series. We want to look at three songs over three weeks. We want to unpack them a little bit, not only from a songwriter's perspective, you know, maybe what his intention was or his or her intention was when writing the song. We also want to have a look at some faith principles that we can maybe draw out of these songs. Not necessarily that the songwriter wrote it with that intention, but that maybe we could find some life application things. Because true to this, Songs stay with us. Songs go with us wherever we're going. And so if we could have some life application in that, that, hey, when I remember that song, I remember that life application thing. And what we're going to talk about today, I think, is one of those key, key things. And so to kick off today, um, I'm going to invite my friend Chris up onto the stage. Uh, Chris is going to perform a song for us. Uh, and uh, while Chris is getting ready, I'm going to just tell you a little bit of history about the song and what is going on with this song. Um, the song is by John Mayer. Um, it's called Stop This Train. And it's off his Continuum album. And uh, John writes, John tells an interesting story when he is uh, performing this song. When he's performing this song live, he takes a moment and he tells a little bit of a story. And uh, the story goes that uh, when his career started taking off, he, life just got so manic for him. He got so busy with trying to do all the press things and trying to get ready for a tour that, you know, life just did really feel like a train that was running out of, running, uh, just running as fast as, as anything in those moments. And he decides one day he's going to go back and visit his parents, uh, go back to home where he felt like it was just um, a great place. And he wants to organize the perfect day for him and his dad. And they go out to their favorite baseball stadium. They're going to have a great day. And as they get in the car to leave, he starts getting a migraine. And he says to his dad, hey, no, 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 we need to turn the car around because if this migraine sets in, I'm done. Like, I'm not going to be able to function today. And he says as he was turning the car around, the storm rolls in literally, the thunder and lightning and rain. The game was probably going to be canceled. But with every lightning strike as he's lying on the couch trying to get through this migraine, he's reminded about the failure of his perfect plans he had for his day with his dad. And so this song wrestles and brings up some things that I'm going to unpack in just a little bit, but I think each and every one of us wrestle with the idea that he uncovers in this moment and that his dad talks about in the song as well. So Chris is going to play, and then I'll be back up in a moment to talk you through that. Young. 
So I play the numbers game to find a way to say that life has just begun. Had a talk with my old man, said help me understand. He said, turn 68, you renegotiate, don't stop this train. Don't for a minute change the place you're in. Don't think I couldn't ever understand. I tried my hand, John, honestly, we'll never stop. Once in a while, when it's good, it'll feel like it should. And they're all still around, and you're still safe and sound. And you don't miss a thing when you cry, when you're driving away in the dark. Singing, stop the string. I wanna get off and go home again. I can't take this thing. Things moving in, I know I can. Now I see we'll never stop this train. We're never gonna stop this train. We're never gonna stop. Chris, um, that song in itself is pretty emotional to me. Um, it's pretty emotional in itself. Um, it's uh, this, this past Monday on September 11th, um, many people around the world remembered what happened with the Twin Towers in uh, the US uh, so many years ago. But uh, 20, uh, September 11th, 2010 um, is the day my father passed away from mesothelioma. And uh, it's a form of lung cancer, commonly known as asbestosis. And I remember the song being around during that time. And I, I had the album, and it was in my car. And uh, it, the song expressed words for me that I could never find, that I could never articulate with my, with my, you know, with my words, with my emotions. I was, I was feeling so emotional during that time. And this song seemed to capture some of the things that I just wasn't able to deal with. Um, John Mayer says it so well. He says, don't know how else to say it. Don't want to see my parents go. I don't think any of us want to see our parents die, right? Uh, one generation's length away from finding life out on my own. And I don't know if you've ever felt like your existence is, and you've never thought about your existence in those terms, but um, you know, when, when your parents are gone, you're the next generation. You're at the top of the family tree. Um, and I remember the song being able to express things that I couldn't express um, on my own. And in May of 2009, my dad was diagnosed with um, lung cancer, and uh, he'd leant on the back of a bucky, getting some stuff out of the back of a bucky, and it hurt his rib, and he'd had some pain in his rib for a couple of weeks, and thought, oh, you know, he cracked a rib or something, and um, when the pain didn't go away after a few months, he ended up going in for a scan. And at the time, I was actually attending a conference in the U.S., and I got an email from my wife, and she said, hey, I, I think you need to phone home. And my gracious hosts at the time allowed me to make that long distance landline call, um, no phones back then, but um, be able to phone back home and say, hey, uh, what's going on? And found out that my, the doctors had told my dad that he had two to 24 months to live. And being on the other side of the world was emotional for me just because I wanted to be with my family, but it, it, uh, it gave me the opportunity uh, to maybe slink away and kind of be in this fairy tale for a couple of weeks while I was at this conference that I could you know, go to sleep and wake up and this was just all a bad dream. But I, I, I wrestled with this, this whole thing while we were over there that my dad, this is, that I'm one generation's length away from fighting life out on my own, that my dad was at some point going to be gone. Uh, he went for a whole bunch of treatment. Uh, he went for laser and chemotherapy, which if you've ever experienced with someone is, is just something else. Um, his lung capacity deteriorated to a point where uh, we could find him in the house by following his oxygen cable. You know, we, we knew what room of the house he was in by following that oxygen cable to where he was. He survived 
um, to see my 27th birthday, and a couple of days later, my brother's 24th birthday, and then 12 days later, on September 11th in 2010, he passed away. And what's amazing for me in the song is John describes something so well. He says this, like, in this moment spending time with my parents, once in a while when it's good, it'll feel like it should, and they're all still around, and you're still safe and sound. And it felt so good being able to be with my family and be able to be with my parents. And, and uh, what he says next is so true. And he says, and you don't miss a thing because you don't. When you're in that moment and you're savoring that, you don't miss a thing until you cry when you're driving away in the dark. I remember going to go visit my parents and getting in the car and realizing that these were the exact moments that I was going to be missing. That I was driving home and that song would come on and I ugly cried the whole way home to, back, back to Pinelands from Sun to West. I remember the song being able to express things that I just didn't know how to express because I was singing just what John sings, that stop this train. This train's moving too fast, just stop it. I wanna get off and go home again. I can't take the speed it's moving in. I know I can't, I can't because someone, because now I see that I'll never stop this train. All I wanted to do was go back to my childhood. All I wanted to go was where I had more time. I wanted to stop this train. I wanted to have control over whatever it was that I could do to have more time with my dad. I wanted to go back to when time kind of felt like it was simple, where we were young on the farm and that I grew up on, and, and it was simple times. And, he, and, and John says this, and he describes it so beautifully, I think. He says, so scared of getting older, I'm only good at being young. I wanted to go back to those days when I was young again. So I play the numbers game to find a way to say that life has just begun. How many of us do that, right? We play the numbers game. How many turn 21 again this year? 31 maybe? 41? We do that, don't we? We play the numbers game because we want to feel young again. We want to go back to that place where we felt young again. And getting old had never, and the consequences that are associated with it, had never been so prevalent to me than they did in this moment then realizing that I was one generation's length away from fighting life out on my own. John in the song has this chat with his, his dad. He says, had a talk with my old man, said, help me understand. He said, turn 68, you'll renegotiate. Hey, John, I'm on the other side of life to you. I'm looking back, you're looking forward. And this is what I would say to you, John. I'm <clears throat> this is what I would say to you, John. Hey, uh, don't stop this train. Don't for a minute change the place that you're in. Don't think that I will ever understand. I'll never understand because I've tried my hand, John. I've tried to do this thing. John, honestly, I will never stop this train. I'll never stop this train. John's dad says to him, hey, if, if, you know, you look at like, life and, and life's going crazy and you want to stop this train, hey, don't stop this train. Don't change where you are right now because that's what we want to do, right? When life gets hectic, when life gets off the rails, when life gets all over the place, we just want to say, hey, I'm done. I'm gonna throw in the towel, I wanna get, I'm, I'm done. Can you just stop this train right now? He says that, hey, I've tried. I've tried to have control over the things in my life. I've tried to do things in my life where I'm trying to steer things in a direction and I realize that I can't. I can't stop this train. And I think that that's something that we, we all deal with, that we wanna have control, right? We wanna control our circumstances. We wanna control what's going on at last, or at least we wanna feel like we are in control. See, my dad being diagnosed with uh, cancer made me realize something. Um, it made me deal with the fact that having him gone, I, I really was gonna feel like I wasn't in control of my life. Uh, I'm someone who has just, from wiring, always believed that things happen to me for a reason. That's just how I'm wired. I'm a very logical person, and so I believe that uh, if I aim for a direction, if I'm going in that direction, I can control the guardrails of where I'm going, that if I stay on this road and I control what's happening left and right of me, I can move in that direction. And I might not get up, end up exactly where I wanna be, but if I get close enough, that's good enough for me, and I can control what's going on. And I made this realization when my dad was diagnosed with cancer, that I'm not in complete control. I'm not in complete control of my education, I'm not in complete control of my job, of my finances, of my family, of my image. I'm not in complete control of what is going on. And I think this is something we all wrestle with, right? Isn't it? We all wrestle with the realization at some point in our lives where we realize that we're not in control because when life's easy, when life's just coasting along and we're on the rails and we're heading in a direction and nothing's sort of going bad, then it's easy, it's comfortable. 
But the desire for control creeps up in each and every one of us when things don't go according to plan, and specifically when they don't go according to our plan, right? It's amazing to me how in a single moment, the desire for control can be so prevalent in our lives. Maybe it's your decision, maybe it's someone else's decision, maybe something happens like an event, a tragedy, a diagnosis. When life's going okay, hey, this doesn't matter. But when life's not going according to your plan and you realize that you're not in complete control, you will do anything and you will sometimes walk over anyone to make sure that you can regain control, don't we? You see, maybe you've been studying for that test or that exam and you've been studying so hard and you walk out of that exam room and you're like, man, I aced it. I did so well in that. Or maybe like it was for me, I worked so hard on a project at university and I felt like I did so well at that presentation only to find out that you failed. Only to find that you might have to repeat that year, that you have to repeat that course, that you have to repeat that subject. And it dawns on you, I'm not in complete control. Maybe you go in for a routine checkup at the doctor and you get that call that says, hey, I think you need to come in for a biopsy. We suspect it may be cancer. No one wants to get that phone call. That wasn't part of your plan for your life, right? You're gonna see your grandkids at some point, right? That was the plan. And you realize you're not in complete control of what is going on in your life. Maybe one day your your business partner that you've had for years and years and years walks in and says, hey, we need to start retrenching people because if we want to keep our doors open, we are going to have to make some cuts here. Or maybe like I've experienced twice in my life, your boss walks into your office and says, hey, you're the one being retrenched. Uh, We're closing the company down and you need to go find another job. You realize that as hard as you work in those moments, as hard as you perform and reach your KPIs in those moments, hey, you're not in complete control of your job. Maybe um, your your spouse comes home one day and suddenly you realize that they've had this gambling habit that has been going on for months and the debt is so big that you have to sell a house to cover that debt. Maybe you get an unexpected bill. Maybe somewhere along the line you get uh, something happens to your car and you have to now pay this bill that is so much more than what you think your car is worth. Suddenly you realize there's no com- you're not in control of your finances. Or maybe your brother and sister phones you one day and says, hey, uh, we're, we're getting a divorce. Or your spouse comes home one day and they just hand you papers and they say, we're getting a divorce. Or maybe you get a phone call uh, from the police station or from prison and your children have been doing something illegal. Or maybe it's a phone call from the hospital and your children were doing something they should not have been doing and have ended up in the hospital. Maybe your child says to you that the plans that you have for me are not the plans that I have for my own life. You realize in those moments that you're not in complete control of everything that's going on in your family. And maybe one that's a little bit more prevalent in our day and age today is you get, ta- you get a notification on uh, a social media account and suddenly you realize that there's a photo that you hoped would never get out and you've been tagged in it. Maybe it was you doing something you shouldn't have been doing. Maybe it was you being somewhere you shouldn't have been. Maybe it was from that time of your life that you wish you could kind of erase, that you know, you've got that bad hairstyle that no one wants to see. Maybe it's from that time of your life. Yes, you can untag yourself and you don't have to look at that photo anymore, but it's online. It is on social media. You are not in complete control of who sees that and you are not in complete control of where that goes to. You are not in complete control of the version of yourselves that you present to the world. You are not in complete control. And it's amazing to me that how in just a single moment, the desire for control can rise up in us and it can be front and center for each and every one of us. And what makes this so much more prevalent in our day and age is our modern technology, right? I mean, with the advancements, technological advancements we have in medicine and agriculture and computing, we're able to have so much more control of our lives. I mean, you hold your phone in your hand, you've got more technology in your hand than you had in your house 20 years ago. When you combine that with modern day consumer marketing, we buy into this idea that we have a myth of control. You see, consumer marketing says to you and me, hey, buy this product. I'd love for you to buy this product. It's gonna make you happier. Your kids are gonna be running around smiling all the time. You're gonna have white teeth. It's just gonna be amazing. (laughs) Consumer marketing says, hey, buy this. There's gonna be happiness. Buy this. There's gonna be, uh, your life's gonna be easier. And then we hit that wall and we realize that the myth of control is just that, that it's a myth. That suddenly it comes, it dawns on us that we are not in complete control of what is going on in our lives. And that desire for control that each and every one of us holds gets so big that it drives people to experience depression, anxiety, and high levels of stress, 
behavior modification, and in some extreme instances, addiction. This desire for control lives within each and every one of us. But it is a myth of control. In psychology, there's a kind of two categories of how you deal with these people. Is, um, you either fall into one of these two categories. You're either an internal locus of control type person or you're an external locus of control type person. If you're an internal locus type of person, you make things happen. You believe that what is, you're able to influence, that you can make decisions and you can make consequences that will positively influence the outcome of where you're heading. You, you, you can, whatever your actions do, your decisions can lead to some um, outcomes, some consequences. And you're okay, you're comfortable with not being in control of everything, but you want to be able to try and influence that as much as you can. You think that you can make things happen and you live with a little bit more freedom in life. If you're an external locus type of person, you believe that things happen to you. You believe that there is this big, great world out there and everything's been happening to you, that uh, you rely on things like fate and luck, um, maybe some powerful people in your lives like doctors and government officials to influence what's going on around you, that you believe there are things happening around you that are influencing how you do. And one of the things that you do if you're an external locus type of person is you blame something or you blame someone for your circumstances and your lack of control. And so if you're an internal locus type of person, you're okay with not having complete control, right? You can decide what you want to have control over, and you're fine with that. But if you're an external locus type of person, you're just going to become more and more convinced that the world is out to get you, and you're going to continue to blame people, blame someone, or blame something. Because life is just that, right? Life is a pretty wild ride. It's uncertain, and it's uncontrollable. And how you deal with your desire for control really comes down to what type of person you are. And if you're an internal locus type of person, you're going to be okay with not having complete control. If you're an external locus type of person, you're going to want control. And you're going to continue to build a case that the world is out to get you. If you're an internal locus type of person, you're going to be fine that you can't stop this train. But if you're an external locus type of person you are going to drive yourself crazy and you're going to drive the people around you crazy trying to stop this train. So Morgan, that, that's, that's really interesting. But like, what's your point? Like, where are you going? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> but for the rest of our time together, I want to look at a conversation that takes place many years ago um, and it's recorded for us by a man named Matthew. Matthew was one of the 12 disciples. He spent a lot of time walking around the earth with Jesus. And this conversation takes place between Peter and Jesus. Now, I'm pretty grateful that Peter was around, and I hope that you are too. Peter was one of the first people who took the message of Jesus to those people who were non-Jewish. So I'm non-Jewish. I'm pretty glad that Peter was around to be able to bring the message of Jesus to me. But the other thing that Peter was is Peter was just like you, and he was just like me. Peter also had a desire for control. Peter wanted to control what was happening around him. And the one thing that Peter tried to do was Peter tried to control Jesus and what was going on in Jesus' life. And so Jesus, we pick up the story, uh, Jesus is kind of uh, walking around and he's telling everybody what's going on in his life. Hey, it's, it's kind of imperative for me to go down to Jerusalem for me to suffer a whole bunch of things and for me to die and for me to be raised from the dead after three days. And Peter doesn't want to see his friends suffer he doesn't want to see his friend ultimately die. And so he pulls Jesus aside and says, hey, 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 I don't think you should be talking about this. Like, this is not a great thing for our, like, movement we have going here. You know, we've got some people following us. We want to, like, get some momentum going. You know, this is pretty cool. Uh, you shouldn't be talking like this. And Jesus turns around and says this to him. He says, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. In that moment there, Peter, uh, Jesus reminds Peter, and I think he reminds the, uh, the 11 disciples standing there and us, that there is something bigger going on that doesn't center around you and me, that there is a bigger point of view that is not just from my point of view. Then Jesus says to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, give up what you want, your ambitions in life, take up your cross and follow me. You've got to surrender what is going on in your life. You've got to give up your own way. Take up your cross simply is not actually physically carry a cross. But take up your cross is more about a personal, it's not, it's not even a call to be a martyr for you. It's more about personal devotion to God. And, and to follow me is saying, hey, Jesus, you're a teacher. I'm interested in your teachings. 
but also pledging allegiance to Jesus, that you're going to follow him in those moments. And Jesus says here that if you want to be a follower of Christ, if you want to follow Jesus, you must give up your own way. You must give up what is yours. When things don't go according to your plan, you're to give those things up. Are we supposed to sit on our hands for the rest of our lives and not do anything? Absolutely not. We're still supposed to have dreams. We're still supposed to have ambitions. We're still supposed to go out there and do what we can and what we want in the world. But when things don't go according to our plan, we're supposed to give up our own way. Jesus carries on and says this, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. If you try and control your life, which we've all tried to do, right? If you try and control your life, you will surely lose it. And if you don't believe me, when the last time you try to control something, remember what kind of a disaster it ended up being when we try to hold on to that thing, when we try to hang on to it and it was running away from us? It can be a disaster. If you try and hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Jesus says that if you give up your life, if you give up your way, in this instance, it might have been that, hey, you're going to give your own life up physically. And that might seem extreme to you, but remember the audience he was speaking to and the persecution they experienced when they professed a belief in Jesus. But Jesus says, hey, if you're going to hang on to your life, if you're going to try and control everything, you're ultimately going to lose your life. But if you give up your life for my sake, if you let go, if you give up your own way, you will surely save your life in that, those moments. You'll be able to save where you're going. You'll be able to save what is happening. See, what's amazing in this story is that Peter really did want to do just that. Peter wanted to control everything because Jesus had come around and he was talking about his kingdom, right? He was talking about his kingdom and everything was going to be cool. And if Jesus was going to be the king, then Peter was going to be a ruler in his kingdom. He was going to have a position of power. Instead of being persecuted like he had been for the last couple of months, he was going to be in a position of power. And if Jesus died, those moments died with him. Those dreams Peter had died with him. They were not going to be the same, and they were not going to be able to be experienced by Peter. And so Peter's trying to control what is going on, and then Jesus died, and his dreams died with Jesus. And if you don't believe me, you know, these 12 men, they didn't run into the streets and go and start the church. What did they do? They went into hiding. They went and hid until three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, and they made the connection that I've been seeing this from a human point of view not from God's perspective, that there is a bigger kingdom going on. And that if I were to give up my own way, that the cost would be worth it, that I would be able to surrender what I was going through. You see, in, in my life, when my dad was diagnosed with cancer, I really did still want to have control. I wanted to have more time with him. I wanted to do everything I could to make sure that he was going to live a little bit longer. I wanted to control that situation as much as I could, but facing that reality, um, really was like me realizing that I'm not going to have more con- as much control as I would like to have with him not around. Because my dad was steadfast. I could pick up the phone, phone him whenever I wanted to and be like, hey, what do you think about this? Well, you know, I need some advice. And I really did feel like facing that, that I was going to be living life out on my own. But truthfully, there's going to be a time in each and every one of our lives when we realize that we are not in complete control of our lives. We're not in complete control of everything that is going on. I believe that I could control the outcomes of the direction that I'm heading in. But when my dad was diagnosed, that all went out the window. I was not in complete control of my life. And I think that when this desire for control rises up in each and every one of us, I think that uh, we want to control things but things get out of hand and we're driven in all kinds of different directions, places we just shouldn't be heading in. And I think that in those moments when the desire for control comes up, we need to remember that life is imperfect. It will always be imperfect. I am imperfect. And so are you. We all are imperfect people. But no one wants to live with the myth of control, right? Because the myth is just that. It is a myth. That we believe that we can have control. And control is a good thing because control gives us this illusion of stability and kind of happiness in the direction that we're moving. But when we lose that, we have to face the fact that we're not in complete control. And when we stumble into that, because each and every one of us is going to stumble into that at some point, uh, we need to try and still find peace in those moments. And the only way we're going to find peace is if we let go of our own way, as Jesus says, that we give up our own way. 
And so what we need to do is we need to control what you can and surrender the rest. You need to control what you can and surrender the rest. Now the key here is to control what you can, is to determine what you can control and what you cannot control. And I think that you need to be honest with yourself about what you cannot control because some of us need to stop beating ourselves up about the things that we have no control over at all. Surrender simply means uh, who you're gonna trust. Surrender simply means who are you going to trust in those moments? And I wanna ask you a question this morning. Do you trust in yourself more than your heavenly father to control the things that you have no control over? Be honest with yourself. Do you believe more in yourself than your heavenly father to control the things that you have no control over? Because those times are gonna come where you wanna control everything and we need to control what you can and surrender the rest. You see, facing the fact that my dad was gonna be dying, it really was quite overwhelming. Uh, it was emotional, it was confronting, it was raw. It was in your face. And it was hard, I mean, it still is hard to deal with. I mean, hearing Chris play that song, I'm I, you know, getting emotional, trying not to ugly cry in front of you, <clears throat> but um, trying to be a man. But uh, I realized in those moments that there were some things I was not able to control. I was not gonna control this train of my dad that was moving way too fast, that my dad was terminally ill, that he was going to die. But there were some things I could control. I could control the relationship I had with my dad. I could control the relationship I had with my mother. I could control the relationship I had with my brother. My brother and my father were very much the same and so they butted heads a lot through his teenage years. I could control that they were able to reconcile their relationship as it came to the end of my dad's life. I could control the fact that my dad could get the best medical care we could afford during those times, during those last few months. And the best of all was that I could control how much time I had with my dad in the last few months of his life. You see, you are gonna face at some point in your life the realization that you are not in complete control of your life. And as much as you wanna try and get that out of the way, it's gonna be front and center. It may be a big thing, it may be a small thing. But it is in those moments that we need to be able to open our hands and be able to say, I trust you more. I'm gonna try and I'm gonna hold on to those things and I'm gonna lose my life, but I wanna give up my own way, as Jesus says. That I realize there are some things that I can control and there's some things that I cannot. And I'm gonna trust you for those things. And it is in those moments that that natural human conflict rises in each of us that we desire to have control over everything in our lives, that we need to control what you can and surrender the rest. Let me pray for us. Father God, it's really um, a lot more simpler to be able to stand up and talk about this than it is to do. Uh, Father, I, I pray for maybe someone here today who's going through that, who is feeling the pressure of not being able to have complete control over what's going on in their lives. Father, maybe as they sit here today, they realize that that's the thing that's eating away at them. Father, I pray that you would surround them with encouragers because they need that. But Father, I also pray that you would help them discern what is controllable by them. And Father, that they may be able to open their hands and be able to say, Father, I trust you more. Father, thank you that your son Jesus trusted you enough to know that even as he faced death, he could trust you with the outcome, that he could trust you with the consequences, that he could trust you. And it's because of that beautiful picture, Father, that we're able to have confidence that you can do that for us as well, that you can control the things that we have no control over. Father, that if we would surrender those things to you, Heavenly Father, we pray for the wisdom to know what to do and the courage to ultimately go out and do it. And we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who came to save each and every one of us. We pray these things in your precious son's name. Amen.